morning. Welcome to worship today. We are glad that you're with us. So many faces we haven't seen in so long, and we are glad that you are here with us today. And for those of us, for those of you joining with us online, uh, we come to worship God together in the presence of God and for the glory of God. And we hope that you will join us in that. Friends, as we gather together, let us gather in our call to worship. In the midst of our failures, in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our suffering, in every part of our lives, holy and gracious God, as we come into your presence this morning, as we gather together as the church and the body of Christ, we pray that your spirit would fill this place, fill our hearts as we worship you, that we would hear your word to us, that we would sing your praises from the depths of our souls, for you are our God. We are your people, called by your name. Gracious God, may our worship be holy and pleasing in your sight as we give thanks and praise and honor and glory to you. In the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Friends, let's now stand uh, together and sing our first two hymns, O four thousand tongues to sing, and I will sing of my Redeemer.
And on the cross, he seals our pardon, pays the debt, and sets us free. And so we can boldly approach the throne of grace with confidence, knowing that our debt has already been paid, that we are forgiven because of what Jesus has done. So as we join in our confession, it is not for sin, or it's not for shame, but to recognize our sin, that we have been set free by the blood of a Savior. Join me as we confess our sins before God and before one another. Heavenly Father, our Savior told us, those who try to gain their own life will lose it, but those who lose their life for my sake will gain it. We confess that we often close our ears and minds to this kind of risk. Lord, we are sorry for being unfaithful. Please forgive our fearful hearts. You alone know how desperately we need connection with you and with one another. Give us courage so that we may respond to your call to us for a deeper life. Guide us, we pray, on an adventure of hope where Jesus remains at the center. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, the good news of the gospel is plain and simple. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed your transgressions from you. Know this and be at peace. Believe the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. This morning we gather as the church on a special Sunday to welcome new covenant partners into the life of our congregation. But these aren't just new faces. These are faces that have been with us for a very long time. Many of them have been baptized here and we get to rejoice and they're joining in the church. Friends, we call them in Eco Covenant Partners for a reason. And that is uh, we are not card carrying members of Meridian Presbyterian Church. We are partners together in the ministry of the gospel, and we make a covenant with one another, a promise to hold each other accountable, to love one another, and to lift each other up. This morning we have uh, five, but we're down to four because the Palmeros are sick, and they don't want to risk it for any of you, so we thank them for that. Uh, and so they are not here this morning, even though Max has completed the confirmation class. These uh, young people actually completed an odd confirmation class and that half of it was in person and half of it was via Zoom. So, you know, that was fun as we all uh, went online in March. But these five young people completed uh, the, recommend, or the requirements of session to join the church as covenant partners and to complete our confirmation class. Confirmation, by definition, is a confirming of our baptism, a reminder of the promise that Christ has made to us in the waters of baptism, that we belong to him. And these young people who have finished this class this morning are now making that public profession of faith that they accept the baptism of their Lord Jesus Christ and join in his church. And so this morning we welcome them. And you have to come forward when we call your name. I'm sorry. <laughs> Bye. On behalf of the session of the Meridian Presbyterian Church, Today we welcome to the life of our church new covenant partners, Grace Barton, Jacob Barton, Joshua, Joshua Bettner, Max Palmeira, and Grace Smith. Go ahead and stand on the staff here. So we made all of them uh, read their statement of faith in front of the session. So you all can go ahead and do that from memory right now, right? You, no? Do you want? Do you need a microphone? 
I'm just kidding. Uh, and we are very, we are all very proud of you, of the work that you've done. We're excited to welcome you as covenant partners in the life of this church. And uh, so we have to affirm a few things in order for you to join. And every person that has joined here has had to answer and affirm these questions. And that is, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the only way to salvation and the only way to the Father? If you do, say, I do. Do you renounce sin and evil in this world, confirming in your baptism that you've been washed clean by the waters uh, in redemption by the blood of Christ? And if you do, please say, I do. And do you promise to be faithful members of Christ's body and Christ's church, particularly this church here at Meridian Presbyterian, as long as you are here and able, that you'll be faithful members of Christ's church living out your calling as those who belong to Jesus Christ, if you do say, I do. Well, Mike left. Now he's back. <laughs> yeah, sanitize your hand. That was weird. Uh, Weird timing, that's all, it's just weird timing, that's all. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, on behalf of the congregation and the session of this church, we are grateful and, and thankful for your public profession of faith in joining this body. And now we're going to pray for you, but because these are uncommon times and we don't want to touch you, not because we don't love you, but because we're not allowed, we're going to ask the congregation to extend their right hand towards these young people as we pray over them. Gracious God. We give you thanks for the commitment that they have made to this body and to this church, but more importantly to you in confirming that you have claimed them and marked them as your own. We pray that you would watch over them, that you would guide them, that these people who make this public, uh, or that these people who gather and call this place home would uphold them, would hold them accountable, would love them and lift them up to be holy and blameless before you and in your sight. We give you thanks for the work that you're doing in, your li in their lives, and we pray that you would continue to make yourself known to them through the work of the Holy Spirit. Bless them as they join this congregation, and bless us all as we continue in the work of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. Amen. So on behalf of the session and the church, we have a gift for you. I'm going to let Mike handle that one. So now the timing makes sense. That makes. Uh, the hand of your Bible with two hands is Gracie Smith. Gracie Smith's work was. Is your mic on? Is he on? Hello. There you go. There we go. Uh, Valerie Mueller uh, was Gracie's mentor. Uh, she's not here today, but we thank her for helping Gracie through this uh, program. Jacob Barton. Jacob was mentored by Bonnie File. Bonnie, you can stand up. She's in the very back. Social distance to the extreme. It's probably the safest place in the church probably. right there, Bonnie. Grace Barton. Mentored by Autumn Moore. Thank you, Autumn. And last but certainly not least, Josh Bogner, who was mentored by Dave Friend. Thanks, Dave. And uh, Max Palmerio, who couldn't be here, but um, he was uh, mentored by Sue Friend. So we're grateful for Sue. Uh, and that is it. Congratulations. And thank you for bearing with us. Uh, they finished this all up in May. so. It's been a while that they've had to wait, but we are glad that you're with us. You can head back to your seat. And at this point, um, yeah, our kids can come forward for the children's sermon. We have a few announcements to make while they're doing that. Uh, things are changing, as always, in this sort of uncommon times. Uh, they're going to sit here. Um, things are, are constantly moving and changing in these weird and uncommon times. The session met this week, and we're going to try something a little bit different for the next month or so. This starting next week, weather permitting, uh, we're actually going to go back to the outdoor service that we did on Picnic Sunday. We, uh, everybody seemed to really enjoy that. Um, and so Debbie and I will set up over here just outside the door, bring your own chair, space out. Uh, you don't have to reserve a spot. Uh, we'll sing, and, and um, it'll be a kind of a pared down service because we won't have any technology or anything. But we would love to have you join us for that. We're going to do that every week. We'll make the announcement on Wednesday, 
on our website and via email uh, about what we uh, plan to do, and we're going to do that based solely on the weather forecast. So, um, but you know, I was sitting out at a soccer game yesterday morning, it was like 55 degrees, and we all made it. So that's what we're going to do. As long as the weather allows us, we're going to be outdoors for, uh, for the worship service, and it will only be one service. Uh, Sunday school will continue at 1010 on those days, but we won't have the morning service. Uh, we will only have the one service outside for those days. Uh, when we are back inside, we'll continue at 9 and 11, but require, it is no longer required for you to reserve, although we are at about max what we should be at in this room right now. So this is about it. That's about as far as we can go. But uh, there are no requirements for uh, reservations. Uh, you can come at 9 or 11, whatever works for your schedule. It is the same service in both. Uh, so if you're early birds, uh, 9 o'clock might work better for you. Uh, and children's ministries will only be running, nursery and children's ministries will only be running at 11 o'clock. So we just want to get you up to date on what the worship plan is. Uh, if you have any questions, you can shoot me an email, but that's what we're going to try. We'll make a new call probably end of October about what we'll do going forward, uh, but that's that's the plan for right now. Um, the I don't have a bulletin in front of me. Trunk or Treat is on as of right now. I told the session that I'm going to make a PVC pipe from our trunk, and we'll just put the candy down the pipe. So you just hold your bag at the end of it. No touching. It's going to work. So I would suggest you all do the same. Uh, so we're going to have a socially distant trunk or treat, so we're not going to put up the bouncy house or anything like that. So we're not going to, we, uh, Fellowship Hall won't be open, that kind of stuff. We're going to be doing that on October 17th. Uh, if you want to sign up, you can talk to Dave. We need to make a call by the end of September on whether or not we have enough participation from the church to do it. So that's going to be the issue. So we need about 20 to 25 cars in order to make it a successful program. Oh, so a sign-up sheet showed up between the two services because there wasn't one there this morning. So there's a sign-up sheet in the library if you'd like to bring a car and do that. We're going to do it for our community. Uh, Eric Shever is going to bring his Apple Press, and, and so we'll still have some of the fall festivities there just won't be like Fellowship Hall. So if it rains, we're going to push back a week to the 24th um, because, and it's not a matter of if, if you have participated in Trunk or Treat in the past. Uh, so we'll push back to the 24th. If it rains on the 24th, we're just going to cancel it. So uh, it can be an outdoor only event uh, this year, but we are moving forward with that. Um, Sunday school kicked off today. We'd love to have you join us for that if you haven't been already. Mike is uh, kicking off youth group today after church, 12.30. So um, those programs are all coming back. Did I miss anything? Gift cards for the Holtgravers. If you don't know uh, that the twins were born, Haley and Danny Holtgraver had twins, about, what, six weeks early, something like that, or a month early. They're, they're tiny. They're in the NICU, and we wanted to bless them as they're going through uh, driving back and forth. So we're collecting gas cards or restaurant cards for them. So that's not something they have to worry about as they go back and forth from the NICU in Pittsburgh. The babies are doing well, though, and Haley's doing well. It's just a lot to have to be going back and forth. So you can drop those off on the visitor center table by the back door, and they'll get delivered today uh, after church. So if you brought something, you can drop it off. We'll still collect them this week. Uh, if you have something to bring in this week or next Sunday, we'll collect them and make sure they get to the right place. But let's support Haley and Danny in this new and... Uh, Top adventure. It's special. It is all kinds. It is all kinds of special. Uh, so let's support them in that. I have a special place for them in my heart at this point after the last two years of our lives. So uh, I think that's it, unless anybody else has any announcements to make. Blood drive. Oh, I'm forgetting everything. <laughs> blood drive? See, there's a lot going on. I told you there's a lot of announcements. We are hosting another blood drive. Uh, it was so successful last time, the Red Cross called us and asked if we'd do another one. So we're hosting another blood drive at Meridian Fire Hall on October 6th. There's still a great need for blood uh, donations here in our area. We're running significant shortages uh, in our blood banks. And so uh, 12 to 5, you can schedule. Just There was some confusion about this. You cannot just show up to the blood drive. You have to register ahead of time uh, or they won't allow you in. It's just part of their COVID protocols. You can register through a link on our website or you can go directly to the Red Cross and they have us marked down October 6, 12 to 5, Meridian Fire Hall. We'd love to have you join us for that, if you can, to help out our community. Okay, I'm not even going to ask. That's the end of announcements, children's sermon. Good morning, guys.
How are we doing this morning? Good. That was a lot of announcements, but isn't it awesome having Sunday school back? I'm just saying, it was great seeing everybody this morning and all the kids coming in and filing back into the church. I have a quick... I'm wondering if anybody has a crisp $20 bill in their wallet this morning. Any cash at all. Doesn't have to be 20. Could be 100. A cr- a cr- the crisper, the better. Ah, Kayla. Well, she's going to get it back because she's doing junior church. and I wanted to do it again. Perfect. I used one this morning. It's not usable anymore. All right. Bad news. Sorry. Okay. What's this? A dollar? What's that number up there? Twenty. Twenty dollars. That's a lot of money. Don't you think that's a lot of money? What could you buy for twenty dollars? A lot of things? Yeah. Candy? A lot of candy. I'm telling you. A lot of candy. Yeah, anything you guys would like, it would buy a lot. Trust me. Like bouncy balls or... I hate bouncy balls personally, but you guys love bouncy balls. Yep. Hair ties. You guys can go into Claire's and almost buy the whole place. All right. So $20. So who would like this $20? You want it? All right. Well, hold on. (laughs) She's really smart. To get back to my mom, she said. I'm going to take this $20. Oh, man. And I'm going to crank it all up. Really small. I'm even going to drop it on the floor. Let me. And I'm going to step on it and crush it. Yeah. Like, I'm going to get shocked. All right. Who wants it now? Cool. Good job, Paul. Good job, buddy. I'll tell you what. All the kids this morning are like, not me. I'm like, okay, you're not getting this. Um, Colt, you want it? Why? Why do you want it? You don't know. Because you would pick up anything off the floor and want it? It's okay. It's your age. All right. Why? What is this still worth $20? Yeah. Absolutely. Even all crinkled up like this, it is still worth $20. It's a mess. I could have dropped it in the mud. I could have found this on the street. And does it still worth $20? Can you still buy something with it? Yeah. Absolutely. So everybody should want this $20 and I want you to understand this $20 bill is just like you and me. When we come fresh out of the mint, when this is made, this piece of paper, when this is made, it is super crisp, and it smells like money, and it's really nice, perfect, just like God made you, perfect in the beginning. But sometimes life, because of sin, we start to get crinkled up, and we start to get mashed up, and we start to form all these mess and dirt, right? Just like sin in our life. But are we worth any less to God? We are not worth any less to God. We're worth the same. He loves us so much. He doesn't care about that sin because we have hope, right? We have hope in Jesus Christ that he died for those sins and they wash away. And we've become crisp $20 bills again. Right? So next time I see you see money on the ground or maybe it's dirty or maybe unwanted or discarded, think about that it's worth the same, just like I'm worth the same to God. Do you find, do you find a lot of money on the ground? Like where you, just, just wondering, just wondering. Uh, are there any prayer requests this morning? Let's pray. Gracious God, we praise you for this day that we gather and worship. We praise you for the church and the opportunity to be together. Father, we pray for your presence in this place, that you would fill us and fill our hearts, that you would equip us, encourage us, strengthen us. We pray that in all things your glory may be made known in us and through us. For even in these times, we know that you are present with us. 
We know that you are our God and that we are your people called by name. And that your glory far outweighs anything in this world. May that glory shine through us and be made known to us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who we worship and know who is the God who has conquered all things. We lift up those in our community who are hurting and in need of your grace and mercy today, those in need of your healing touch. We pray that you strengthen them in the days and weeks ahead. And you would fill us with your presence. As we take a moment to pray silently before you, we ask this day that you'd hear those unspoken prayers of our hearts. Gracious and holy God, we lament for our brothers and sisters on the West Coast who have lost everything. For those that we hear about in our eco churches, our sister churches in California and Washington, whose churches have been burned, whose homes have been lost. Send relief and rain, O oh God. Set them free. We pray for those who are fighting those fires, that you would strengthen them. God, in all things, we pray that you would be glorified. We pray for this divided and, and broken country, the tensions, the anger, the fear, the anxiety, all that is rising up between us. May we be reminded that we are one in the spirit of our Lord together as the church, that we don't give way to the division that we don't give way to fear. But we live in the palm of your hand, the God who is over all things. May we be a calm presence, a light in the darkness, a calmness in the chaos. We pray these things in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our first scripture, oh, off to junior church. I forgot about that. Sorry, guys. You can hang out here if you want. No, my own kid said no. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, reading verses 1 through 6. Hear now the reading of God's holy word. Lord, you are my God, and I will exalt you and praise your name, for in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. You have made the city a heap of rubble, the fortified town a ruin, the foreigner's stronghold a city no more, it will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will honor you. Cities of the ruthless nations will revere you. You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall and like the heat of the desert. You silence the uproar of foreigners as heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud. So the strong and ruthless is still on this mountain. The Lord will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine and the best meats and the finest wine. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
And some days of glorious morning I shall see Him face to face And it's all because of God's great grace Through disappointment and death This morning, we are continuing a series that we began last week that seemed to, at the very least, strike a chord with people. I told Laura I got more positive feedback last week than any, I think, sermon I've ever preached. I'm not quite sure why, but uh, it was interesting to me. We are going through a series called It Doesn't Say That, and the focus of the series is taking these, these um, sayings that people use or say in Christianity that aren't actually in the Bible. So things that people might think are in the Bible. I've had conversations in my time or in my life where somebody said, well, it's in the Bible. And I'm like, well, I'm not sure what Bible you're reading, but it's not in the one that I read. And, um, and, and so we're going to take a look at those over the next couple, a month or two, all the way through the end of October, about what that means. What does it say about us when we say these sayings? Some of them are things you might find on a wall hanging in somebody's house or something like that. They're, they're kind of kitschy. Christian sayings, but they're not actually what Scripture teaches us. And as Presbyterians and as Christians, we're reformed according to John Calvin, but we're always reforming back to Scripture, which means everything that we believe or say or think we have to take through the lens of Scripture. Does this pass the test? And this morning we turn our attention to a well-known phrase, one that we've heard, I'm sure you've heard before, I've heard it, and I generally hear it when it's around some kind of charities, particularly Christian charity. And that is God helps those who help themselves. Or another way that we phrase this is to say that I help those who help themselves. What does that say about us and how we understand the nature and character of God? Because truth is, that's not in the Bible. What is, is Romans chapter 5. Verses 1 through 11. Hear now the reading of God's holy word. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace by which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character Hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, just at the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom we have now received reconciliation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray this morning that we would hear your word to us and understand your grace to us. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My uh, two oldest boys, Colt and JD, have decided that they wanted to play fall baseball, which is uh, fun, also crazy time for us. Fall is always just insane. Uh, Laura's refing and church meetings start back up and everybody took the summer off and it's just go, go, go. And so we're in this fall baseball season. I'm the assistant coach because uh, I just don't have the time or the energy uh, when I've got two, two kids on my arms, two kids on the field. It just doesn't work out very well for me. But we've had to uh, mix the younger kids and the older kids together. It's very interesting Dynamic. Colt's only four. He's in preschool, but he's on a team with some kids who are like seven going on eight and in second grade, which is a huge gap. So Colt played t-ball, but now he's playing with the older kids in coach pitch. And so it's this very fascinating dynamic when you see these kids from t-ball make their way up into the next level. Uh, t-ball, I coached this year, which I will, I will never do again. I call it coaching purgatory. It is uh, preschool teachers, if you're one of them, God bless you. You are a special kind of special, I think. Uh, and, and so this thing about t-ball, though, is the kids don't truly understand what they're supposed to do or where they're supposed to go. And so it, it's, there are no rules, right? The rules are everybody hits, everybody gets on base, everybody scores, nobody gets out. It's this very utopian way of understanding. I mean, we kind of wish the world operated that way, right? Like everybody gets everything. Nobody's sad, nobody loses, every, you know, it's all wonderful and great. We don't keep score. It drove me crazy. But for them, I'm sure they, they, had, they had fun. But the problem is, is that when they jump up to the next level and they're, they're playing by the actual rules of the game, right? So at JD's level, if after six pitches, if you don't hit it, you're out. You know, they're out to the bases. You, 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 three outs and you switch innings. And, and so there's this shift into more realistically what baseball is, right? But these kids, these young kids, have a really hard time making that change. For the last two weeks, I swear, if they do it tomorrow night, I might lose my mind. For the last two weeks, every time that one of those T-ballers doesn't get to hit in an inning, they stand there with their helmet and their bat, and they won't go out in the field, and they kind of hit their bat on the ground, and they go, but I didn't get to bat. Like, they don't understand they don't understand that that's not how we're playing because they don't understand the rules of the game. And so they don't get, like, you know, four-year-olds can't play first base with an eight-year-old throwing the ball at them. They can't catch it, right? So they don't understand all of those things. And so I was kind of watching that play out this week, and it just, it hit me. Like, t-ball is a world full of grace, right? Like, they, they don't have to play by the rules. They... Everybody gets everything, and, and now they can't make the shift because they've gotten so used to or, or believe that this is the way that it's supposed to be that when they don't get it, they feel like something has been stolen from them. Like, I have taken away their birthright to hit in this very inning, right, by not letting them back. And so it just hit me that this is actually a perfect story or image for us of grace, that this is how we expect because we, we've gotten used to it, because we believe that this is how the world is, that this is how we expect the world to be. So when things get taken from us that are actually our blessings, we're, we're kind of like those four-year-olds, kind of stomping our feet. This isn't fair. This isn't right, right? Because we've just gotten used to these things as, as our expectations. When our blessings become our reality, they often become our expectations. So then when we lose those blessings, we, we feel like we've been robbed of something that is owed to us, something that we deserve. And, and 
try to convince a four-year-old that they don't deserve to hit. It's really a difficult thing to do. You see, in a way, we've become very numb to what grace is or what we understand grace to be because it's been poured out on us, according to the scriptures, to the point where it is in such abundance that in a way, we start to think that it's owed to us, that we deserve it or that we're worthy of it. And so what we get, this is our mentality in our culture, what we get is owed to us. What we get is what we deserve. What somebody else gets, well, they're just living off the system. They're just entitled. They're just fill in the blank. Right? What I get is deserved. What somebody else gets, not so much. And, and that's the world in which we live and the way in which we function and operate. I had this very fascinating conversation on Wednesday morning in our Coffee and Conversations Bible study. Somebody asked the question, not exact paraphrase, but somebody asked the question along the lines of, why is it that we're so apt to say we're sorry, but not ask for forgiveness? And think about it, that's true about the culture in which we live. We, we will say we're sorry, but we're not that excited about asking somebody else to forgive us for what we've done wrong. Sorry puts everything in your hands. You have the power. Because you can apologize for something you've done wrong. Even if the other person doesn't accept the apology, you can just go, well, I said I was sorry. I did what I had to do, right? But forgiveness, that's far different. Because forgiveness is outside of your control. Forgiveness is not something you have power over. Because forgiveness can only be offered by the one who was wronged. It can't be offered by the one who did the wrongdoing. And if you're in the wrong, you can't force somebody else to forgive you as much as you'd want to, as much as you would like that they do that. You can't force that on somebody else. Forgiveness comes at a cost only to the forgiver, not the forgiven. Right? So to say you're sorry is to go, well, I did what I needed to do, but to, to ask someone for forgiveness actually makes you vulnerable because it's outside of your power. It's outside of your control. And we're Americans, and we don't like things outside of our power or outside of our control, right? So we say we're sorry, which isn't wrong. But to ask for forgiveness, that's a whole other step. It's a totally different thing, actually. Because while it admits your wrongdoing, it is now on the other person. It's on the forgiver to take on the cost, right? Are you with me? Because when we look at our lives and our sin, and we look at that against the backdrop of grace and how we understand that grace to work, the only thing that can forgive us of our sins is the one that we have wrong. And it's not ourselves. We can't forgive ourselves for the things that we've done wrong. We can apologize. We can say, we're sorry for doing this or doing that. We're sorry for this sin that's gripped my heart and I wish I could get rid of it. We're, we're sorry. But sin, by definition, is against God. That's what it is. And so the only one who can forgive that sin is not you, but him. And that's what Paul writes in Romans. In Romans 5, it, it, Paul, he kicks off with the word therefore at the beginning of chapter 5. So just a, a quick little tip. If you're ever sitting there reading your scripture and you read the word therefore, just go back a few verses and get an understanding of why Paul uses this word a lot. Therefore exists. And Paul says at the end of chapter 4, he was handed over to death as a judgment for our sin. Therefore. So he's talking about to the Roman church, who Jesus is, what he has done. He was handed over to death as a judgment for our sin. That's the end of chapter 4. So therefore, you have peace with God. You have peace with God, not because of what you've done, but because of what has been done for you. He has poured out, according to Paul, his grace on you through the blood shed on the cross. He has poured it out on you 
And because of that, you have peace with God. And because of that, you have the hope of glory. Hope of glory. But when you, for me, when I read the first couple verses of chapter 5 this week, I'm like, wow, that seems like really relevant words for the world and culture in which we live today. Because the hope of glory and the promise of peace with God is not the promise that life will be good and that all will be well or that you are in control of your life. The peace of God, the hope of glory is because of what Jesus does for you. That's grace. That's love. And it's that grace and love that gives us perseverance, that perseverance might finish its work, that we have hope. Hope, not in ourselves, not in our ability, not what we can do, not in what we have done, but hope in Jesus. It's simple. It's that simple. So you may be wondering, what in the world does this have to do with people who say things like, God helps those who help themselves? Because it's sort of, it's a long way building up to the, Laura's, Laura's winking at me, like, get to the point, Steve, here we go, right? There's a point, I promise, so you just got to bear with me. But it's going to be another couple minutes till we get there, right? Uh, but Paul, in, in his writing, as he continues in verse 6, here's what he says, and it's really important that we grasp it. In his time, when the time was right, God sent his son to die for the ungodly. So I, I've, got, I've got good news and bad news. The bad news is you're the ungodly. All of you, myself included. You are ungodly. And that can be hard for us to hear, but it's the reality of who we are. We are the ungodly. But pay attention to what he says. While we were powerless, he sent his son to die for the ungodly. You can't forgive your own sin. We are powerless. And God sends his son for you. Not because you're worthy. Not because you're holy. Not because you're righteous. Not because you come to church or watch church online. (laughs) While you were powerless. And Paul says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though someone may dare to die for a good person. What does he mean by that? Well, you could probably, if you're willing to name any of them, think of maybe just a few, probably your own kid, that you'd be willing to die for. And some of you, maybe not even that. See, Paul says that, that very rarely, in that rare circumstance, someone might die for a noble cause. Someone might die for a good person to lay down their life, but that, that in and of itself is very rare. That someone might do it, but don't, don't, count, your, don't count on it. Don't count that it's going to happen. Right? Maybe. And we'd like to think, as we look at ourselves in the mirror, that we are good and righteous and noble and holy. But you see, friends, we're the ungodly, and we should embrace that. Because God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This radical crazy understanding that God doesn't die for the holy and for the righteous, but for the helpless, for the broken, for the sinner. It is to show the depth and magnitude of his love and of his mercy. That while you were powerless in your sin, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, you're the helpless, and so am I. The very character and nature of God is to act on behalf of the helpless. It's what he does 
when he sends his son. So that's who God is, right? He acts first. And first John tells us that we love because he first loved us. You see, it's God's action that is first. We simply respond to his action in the world. Grace offered. Forgiveness given. And the question is whether or not we will recognize our own helplessness and accept the gift that Jesus offers to us at the cross. The reconciliation offered to us by what Jesus does for us. You see, the very character and nature of God is not to help those who help themselves. It is to offer himself to the helpless. God acts, and we respond. And if that's the nature of God, if that's the character of God, if that's who Jesus is, and we are his church, in order to reflect the image of God into the world, in order to reflect Christ to the world, to be a light in the darkness, we have to operate with the same love, with the same attitude, with the same sacrifice, with the same grace, with the same mercy on how we serve the world. Because the mission of God is simple. It is for all that we might respond to his grace and his mercy. But here's the problem. When we say things like, God helps those who help themselves, or I'll help those who help themselves, what we're actually doing is taking the place of God. We're becoming the judge. What we're saying is, I will help those who are worthy of my charity, those who are worthy of what is mine, my time, or my talents, or my treasures, that I will judge who is worthy of what I have to offer. Praise be to God that Jesus doesn't look at the cross and say they're not worthy of my life and what I give to them. Jesus doesn't go to the cross because we're worthy. We go, he goes to the cross because we were helpless in our sin and he offers himself for us. And to be the church, to be who Jesus has called us to be, we have to reflect that to the world and how we serve one another and how we serve our community in this broken and dark world in which we live. To fulfill the mission of God. Not by choosing who's worthy, but serving out of love and sacrifice and grace. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we all get to be t-ball players, right? But it isn't because we deserve it. It's a merited grace. It's because of who he is. And it should be because of who we are. But because of who he is, that's who we are. This morning, we had the joy of confirming these four young people, soon to be five, whenever we can figure out that logistic. And I couldn't think of a better image for us than baptism, about God's grace being first. God's grace offered to us first. As any of you know, I grew up in the evangelical world. We had uh, in the assemblies, we were a break off, we were non denominational, we were a break off of assemblies of God. If you don't know anything about assemblies of God, they only do believers' baptisms. And what that means is you have to be old enough to confirm what you believe in order to be baptized, right? And so if my kids showed up at my family church, they wouldn't accept their baptism, right? Which is, you know, it's fine. There's the theological differences there, and it doesn't bother me, but that's just the reality of it. So, so my entry into the Presbyterian Church, this was one of the things that I had to reconcile with how I grew up in the world that I grew up in. And one of the things that sealed the deal for me, which I realized in the first service that that's sort of a theological pun, nerd joke that most people won't understand, so I won't tell it this time, because they didn't laugh at it this morning, so 
they're, they're the test case in the morning, right? See what hits and what doesn't, and then we'll finish it off. But what sealed the deal for me is when I read this, and I don't remember who the author was, but I read this in a book about infant baptism, that we believe in infant baptism and the marking of God because we believe that God acts first. Not in baptism. His grace is poured out on us. Not because a, a baby is able to recognize who, what is happening or what's going on. We, we know that to be true, but it's because God is acting in our lives far beyond our ability to recognize it. God's actions first. And so when we come and confirm these kids this morning, what they're actually doing by definition, that's why we call it confirmation, it's not because they're confirming that they're Presbyterian or that they're confirming that they're going to join our church or that they're, confir they're confirming that God has claimed them and marked them in the waters of baptism. His grace and love poured out on them before they ever knew it existed. We love because He first loved us. And when we were powerless in our sin, He died for us. As the church of Jesus Christ, we participate in the mission of God with our action, not our words. We will show the love of Christ in our sacrifice to the world for the sake of the kingdom. Because God is for the helpless. And you were once one of them. But by His grace, you now live in the hope of glory. as we are image bearers of Jesus in the world, and we act in the mission of God and draw people unto Christ by His grace to the helpless, to the lost, to the lonely, the outcast. God is for the helpless, and so are we. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let us now stand and affirm what we believe by stating the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So many of you, it is good to see your faces again. We are uh, the Church of Jesus Christ, sent out into the world to live by His grace and to draw people into it. Friends, the attitude of the Church is that we take on the attitude of Christ and how we serve others. Even if they take advantage of us, we do it for the glory of God. That's our driving force. May it be all that we do. You see, friends, this is the power of the cross. That He has paid the price for us. As we go from this place, may God be gracious unto you and make His face to shine upon you. And until we meet again, may He hold you in the palm of His hands. We go in the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of the Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Maybe with you now and forevermore. Amen.